Hi, I'm Dave Lavelle. Today is March the 28th, 2020, and we're going to be talking about timing. Photography to me is all about light and composition. It's also about timing. In fact, I created a triangle called the Moments Triangle to help remind us of this. Timing is really about capturing storytelling moments, what we call these fleeting slices of time. We also can call them half-second happenings. I don't call split seconds because I think there's, a, there's even less than a split second here. The picture of Andy, Andrew McCutcheon in uh, Pittsburgh at spring training in the last uh, couple of days of spring training. He just got done hitting a home run and he's watching the ball kind of sail away and I noticed that the bat is just leaving his hands. Some moments are quiet everyday happenings found on the sidelines or in the shadows of life. Matter of fact, I think most of our moments in lives are probably small moments, uh, stuff that doesn't really happen in, under, the, under the big lights. This is a moment of a father and a, and a son after an all-star game. The father is consoling the son after he struck out. One of my probably more famous pictures is a, what's called the Baby Contest in Altoona, Kansas in 1979. A, a small out-of-the-way town and a, certainly an out-of-the-way event. Here's a picture of one of the dogs that is, uh, he, there was one of his playmates that was hit by a car and he doesn't quite understand what's going on. And so he ends up holding the vigil for, that, for, his, for his playmate for a long time. Other moments are more difficult. They reveal a deeper, more complex view of our humanity. Like this picture of this man in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, in a rescue mission, I believe. It was about 1976. It was winter time, and when I look at him, I think I see myself sometimes. We're, we're often at, at crossroads in our lives, and we're at difficult places. And when I look at a picture like this, it reminds me of that. One of my favorite pictures in the last couple of years was of my father, who passed away about a year and a half ago. One of the things about my dad was he was he was great about being photographed. In fact, I think he would, you know, if I didn't take pictures of him almost every day when I was there, uh, he would have been surprised. He never told me, no, don't take a picture of me doing something. And so even the last couple of weeks of his life, it, it was I felt it was important to make pictures that that represented the time. You know, it breaks my heart that he that he's gone, and I uh, I miss him, but I've always was always thankful that he was uh, so open about being photographed, so that we could make these real moments. Here's a picture of my wife and my youngest son. She went to New Orleans to visit the the crypt of her grandmother, and she became overcome with emotion, and she was actually carrying the camera, and she handed the camera to me, and and I made a picture of it because I thought it was an important event, an important time. Another uh, photograph from the, about the 1980s that, was, that had a lot of play, uh, an important time. This was a, a woman named Sherry, and she had, her and her husband had adopted a, a, a young lady, a, a girl named Amber. And Amber, you know, even when they adopted her, they knew that she was, you know, she was terminal. She was going to die from this skin disorder eventually. And when she did die, uh, Sherry called me and told me that she was going to go to the funeral home and she was going to dress the body of her daughter and put her in a casket. And I felt like this was a really important moment. It kind of represented uh, the heartache, the grief, and, and the determination that these people had in, in taking these children. Timing is also about capturing humor, which I call grief's twin. You know, we can't just dwell on things that are sad because there are many, many funny things in life. And a lot of them are very quiet and subtle things, but they're still, they're still funny. Like this young lady on the first day of school in second grade. Or my youngest children fighting in the back seat of the car. Tucker, a couple of years older than Henry, uh, was, you know, kind of pushing him and actually he's yanking his finger that I can see. And Henry's determined he's going to go nose to nose and not be pushed down by his big brother. This picture from Kansas in 1979. I don't know. I find humor in it. 
especially when the the idea of the game is that you want to increase your odds, you know, and so having a dog take one of the spots to help their odds. And this was my son again, Henry. Henry and his friend Dutch. Dutch was a was a, a the dog of a friend of ours, and Henry would, uh, had such affection for that dog. Dutch is uh, asking them for some cereal here. And then I told my friend uh, Vic Winner that I would never tell anybody his name. He, we were actually at the uh, Pictures of the Year competition, and I turned around and Vic was gone. And I thought, well, I wonder where he went. And I went into the restroom and I saw him, saw this image, and I, and I, <laughs> I fired a shot off. And uh, Vic goes, La Belle. He, he, he knew he'd been had. Here are a few tips for increasing your odds of capturing storytelling moments. First things first, you got to keep a camera handy. If you don't have a camera, <laughs> we're out of luck. You know, so many people will tell me, oh, I saw this great thing happen. And I said, well, did you get a picture of it? Oh, no, I, I didn't have my camera with me. I thought, oh, man, how can you do that? You've got to keep a camera. Next thing I would say is make sure that you have uh, batteries charged in your camera. I, I, I hate to admit this, but I've missed a lot of pictures through the years because I, my batteries weren't charged as, I, as they should have been. And then have space on your memory card, at least in this digital era, of course. Uh, what happens is people, you know, whether it's your cell phone or, you know, your cell phone, your, it, it's full. Or, or your card is full and you're thinking, oh, i got to quickly delete something. And by the time you try to delete something, the moment's over. It's gone. You've got to have space. And then I think finally is you want to make sure that you check your exposure. When I go into a dark room, you know, when I'm going from the outdoors into the indoors, it's just automatic for me to to change ISO and to change settings because something could happen inside there. And, uh, and the same thing is, is true in the reverse. So if I'm, I'm indoors and it's dark and then I go out into the bright sunlight, I'm going to go outdoors. I, I quickly change the ISO again and I have a, you know, try to do a basic exposure. So if something did happen, I would be ready. You have to really be prepared for the unexpected. This was a, a, a photograph that would never have happened had I not you know, really been lucky and prepared at the same time. You know, the old saying is that that luck is really when preparation meets opportunity. I was in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and this is what's called a fish ladder. I was trying to photograph salmon going up the up, you know, up the fish ladder with a real long lens. I think I was using a 500 millimeter lens, and I was just seeing if I could, if I was quick enough to capture them. And there weren't many fish jumping, and so I saw a guy down by the ocean, or by the ocean side, by the by the the riverside and I you know he had a camera with him and I thought well I'll go, I'll go down and just talk to him so I you know I had a Nikon F and I had you know I put on a 135 millimeter lens and I pre-focused on an area and just held the camera at my waist and when this salmon you know jumped and hit the wall I instinctively fired it and I told the guy I said man I think I got that and he said oh there's no way you could have got that and I said no I really think I did and then when, when I was able to develop the film and look at it, I thought, boy, that was, a, that was a heck of a moment. And I love this moment, too. This was a friend of mine's wedding. And it was so funny because uh, Joey, is, uh, he just talked to Danielle you know, earlier and said, now make sure you don't mess up your lines and stuff. Well, naturally, when this got going, the wedding actually happened. You know, Joey is the one that messed up his lines, and he, he leans back and laughs. You have to anticipate what could, what could happen. I think sometimes we talk about having an imagination. We say, imagine if this happened. You know, imagine if I won a million dollars. Imagine what would I do? Well, it's the same thought process, I think, when you're talking about storytelling moments. You have to anticipate what could happen. Now, this is a pretty easy one to anticipate. Uh, my sister, and this is her son, Devin. And Devin's playing in the yard on a hot day, and uh, he, he's playing with a sprinkler, and well, the sprinkler's not on. And uh, then he says, well, watch this. And so she turns the water on, <laughs> and you know there's going to be a response to it. It was so fun. This is a photograph that it took you know, several weeks to make. I was in, in Clearfield, Utah, I believe is where it was, and I had an assignment, and I was... I'd driven by this yard and I saw this mangy old goat and a dog and some geese or something in the yard. And I thought it would be great if that goat was goat or the dog was over by the sign as though they were reading it. It would be fun. And so I, it didn't happen that day. I waited a little while. And the next couple of times I passed through Clearfield, I would, I would drive by this yard and I would look again and nothing happened. 
probably the third or fourth time I came by and I and I one day I saw the goat walking toward the sign. I thought, oh, this is going to be the chance. And he did, just like right on cue. He walked over there and looked like he, you know, he'd read the sign for the first time. This picture of Ronald Reagan, President Ronald Reagan, it, it, it only happened because I was thinking about what position I would be in. I had a press credential and I was in the press pool and it was, uh, you know, you're, they, they, they sort of cordon you off. You're in a particular area generally. And I put the credential in my back pocket, and I thought I'm just I'm going to go in with the crowd and just be one of the one of the one of the people. And it was a good call, so I I was able to anticipate where the president might go, where he might walk, and then you know let him come to me instead of me moving toward him, which is a bad bad sign. <laughs> it's a bad thing to do around the Secret Service if you make any quick moves toward a president. They they don't they don't appreciate it. And I love this picture here. This is what's called the Jerusalem Crow, and you know, this was in Caesarea, Israel. And I, I'd watch this. I'd watch the crow, you know, in, in the shade there, and he was wandering around looking for some kind of bugs or something there. And and I thought, boy, it'd be great if he would just kind of go into this opening a little bit. And uh, I waited and waited, and eventually he did. He he, he finally decided he was going to fly out to sea. And I love it because it's so symbolic to me. It, it reminds me of it because this is the spot where the Apostle Paul had left and, and went to Rome. So I've always was very moved by this picture. It's really important too, I think, to know the players and the landscape that they're going to be operating in. It, it certainly helps you get the kind of moments that you're looking for. Uh, I think what happens is that, you know, we show up, we just show up at an event. And you can't just, you can't just have to show up at an event. Usually if you have time, you want to know who you're photographing and what the circumstances are. So much of what we do is really about psychology. It's about knowing human nature. It's about knowing, you know, how somebody's going to act, what they're going to do in a given situation. This was a picture of the late Harry Carey you know, singing, you know, "Take Me Out to the Ball Game" and you know, the seventh inning stretch, you know, which was a, was a famous thing, particularly for Chicago Cubs fans. And I wanted to make this picture. I'd seen it on television, and I, and I thought I wanted to make a picture. Had it not been for for Tim Brokamo, one of my former students, who was working in Chicago at the time, we'd never been able to do this. He he had to, you know, had to work this out so that I could get in the in the press box with Harry, and meet him and talk to him, which eventually I was able to do. And so I just love this picture. It's sort of going to be a timeless picture, of a of a, of a you know a legend. And if you're uh, if you're under fifty years old, you probably don't know who this guy on the left is. His name was Marlon Perkins, and Marlon Perkins was a uh, was Mr. You know, Mutual of Omaha. Uh, he had a, a television series when I grew up, and so we had always watched Mutual of o Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And uh, I love Marlon Perkins, and so I knew enough about him to know that he, you know, how much he loved animals. He was at this nature center in Utah, and he was talking to people and moving around. And I, one thing I noticed about him that is. You know, he 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 always he's always going to interact with some kind of an animal. <laughs> Not I didn't think a stuffed one, but I positioned myself down below this this stuffed beaver, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll get lucky. Maybe he'll show some kind of interaction to this thing. I didn't ask him to do anything. In fact, I don't think he even noticed me, quite frankly. But when he walked by, he just reaches down and he takes the hand of this of this stuffed beaver, and I thought that was the funniest thing, and so so representative of the man. And here's another picture that we that knew we were, we were coming and talk about knowing the players. The uh, the principal at the at the school told me that that uh, this young woman named Sadie that her dad was coming from Afghanistan, coming from war, and he was going to surprise her. So by her telling me that, it, I was able to position myself and have the right lens and the right exposure, and be able to get the be able to capture this moment. I, I you know if it, it just suddenly happened. It, and I had no background, then I would I probably, I mean, I might have got something, but it might not have been this picture. Another, probably one of my favorite pictures in the last few years is, is a picture of a, of a father and a son. And I love pictures of fathers and sons to begin with. I love those relationships. But this is a picture of, um, of Rick Lauer, you know, embracing his son, Eric, after Eric was just, uh, was just taken in the MLB draft by the San Diego Padres in the first round. 
and uh, if you knew, if you to know these people, you, you know the love the, that that these that this father and son had, it would make this picture, you know, so much better. And as it would, as fate would have it, I would say, you know, Eric went on. It wasn't fate that he ended up getting drafted. He got, he was drafted. He ended up playing in the minor leagues only about a year. And the Padres called him up after about a year, and he started in their rotation, and he still is. But the thing about it was that you know his father had had wanted this for him. He wanted his son to be able to play in you know Major League Baseball, and he supported him all this time. And so when when that when this draft night happened, and that that dream finally was realized, uh, it was just a great moment. And thankfully, you know Rick was able to see Eric play Major League Baseball to pitch in the major leagues before he died about, about about a year ago now. It really, I think, uh, so, such an important part of storytelling is, is, is watching for cause and effect, or I often say the action and the reaction. If something is just one-dimensional, somebody's just doing something and there's no response to it, that's not a very storytelling moment for me. I love this moment. You know, you can look at this you know, young lady. She's about ready to get a, you know, a shot. and You can see where her eyes are and the body language. And so, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. There's a, there's a story in the picture. And I love this moment as well. Uh, this, this is when Andre Ethier was signing autographs before a game. I think it might have even been a spring training game. I'm sure it was in Arizona. But I noticed that, that you know, it's not just the signing. You know, somebody signing the, the, the you know, the, uh, the baseball or signing, a, you know, uh, programs. That's one thing. But the response to that is what really, you know, makes this thing so rich. I love this young woman's, you know, response to finally seeing Andre either up close. And I guess he might have signed something for her as well. Here's a picture in Israel that I shot of this uh, Orthodox Jew. He's walking down the, uh, probably getting ready to some sort of a, uh, you know, ceremony there, his daughter's following him, and, but you notice the response to the people. You know, it, talk about a cause and effect. You know, he, here's a, a dress that this person feels that they need to be wearing. It's an uh, honor, I suspect, but to a child, it looks funny, and to anybody, it would kind of look funny. But I love all, I love the layers of emotion, the layers of reaction to this one event. And I tell people sometimes the best and the most storytelling moments happen before or after scheduled events. I, I tell my students again and again, if you show up on time, you're 10 minutes late. You have to get there early. You have to be able to look at the landscape and, and, and find the best position and anticipate what things are going to happen and then look for those kind of moments because a lot of us reveal how we feel about things before or after events. Usually, you know, when we're on the stage or the light is on us or we're at the, at the podium and the microphone, you know, we're going to be a little, we're going to be a little tense and we're going to, you know, try to, to, I guess, say our, the script that we might have prepared, might have uh, even rehearsed. But when, if, before that happens, we're different. And after something happens, we're different. So when I look at this picture of, you know, these young children, it's a pie eating contest. And uh, you look at their faces, look at their response, look at their anticipation. If you waited until, you know, the, the picture that everyone else is going to see that you're going to probably see published is when they start, you know, smearing their faces into the pumpkin pie and it's going to have whipped cream on it. And, you know, those are always the fun pictures, but they're really one dimensional pictures. And they don't give us a, they don't give us the insight of, of sort of the human character. There's so much, again, as I said, so much of what we do is about psychology. I love this picture too. It's quiet, but you know, in baseball, once the season is over, uh, it's a tradition with some teams to say all, you know, the whole team signs a baseball, e each person signs it. So they have this because they probably are not going to play together again. And some of them might not even see each other again. And finally, there's this wonderful picture of this young man that it was during a, a Thanksgiving, a special Thanksgiving dinner, I think. It might have been at the boys' club. And the media showed up, and they photographed people, you know, you know, having the, having the Thanksgiving and being served. But when it was over, I just watched this one child, and he just leaned his head back and just was so full of joy for that moment. Another thing to remember is that 
as I said, as bad is good. Now, don't go around and tell people I said that bad is all right. Bad is good. It's an acronym, which means before, after, and during. We want to get to the event before it happens so that we can see what's going to happen. We can plan for what's going to happen. We want to stay afterwards as long as we can, to, again, to see this, the response that people have to a particular event. And then we also want to be make sure that we're photographing during the event. Here's a great example of, you know, that was put together by a former student of mine named Fran Gardler, who is now working in Nebraska. Fran's a great photographer. Great, he, he understands psychology. He understands you know, lensing, and he understands sports. He's just a really good photographer. And I, was loved, I loved this series that he did. He sent to me. It was a picture of, of Tom Osborne. Uh, Nebraska's, you know, longtime coach, uh, you know, beloved coach. I mean, everybody, he'd been there forever and had some great, great years. And the program was sort of falling off. And I think the feeling was that he was being asked to leave. He was being probably pushed, pushed out. So there was a press conference and he was retiring. And this was a picture that, that, that Fran, uh, you know, made of Tom Osmond before the press conference started, which was wonderful. There's a you can look at the pensiveness. You can look at that. There's sort of an introspection. He's thinking about where, you know, what's happened, what's going to happen. And then here's the obvious picture. This is the press conference picture. This is a, you know, during during the press conference, he's smiling. He's got the big Nebraska N behind him. Everything looks good. But the great thing about Fran is he he you know he kept he kept focused on him. He kept watching Osborne, and he's looking for a picture that's a little more interpretive. And he and he boy he nailed it. I love this picture. I talk about a, a symbolic picture. You notice that the uh, the elevator doors are closing, and it's sort of symbolic of the closing of a of a great career by a by a you know once again a, a loved man. So he he did it. He understood what it meant to be there before, and he shot it during, and he made and he made sort of the definitive picture after. So what can we, how we can end this up is I would tell you to stay alert. You know, stay focused. Fortunes can change so quickly. This is a series of a, a woman in, in Lexington, Kentucky. She's betting on a horse, and she's, uh, she's very happy because her horse is doing very well. And almost <laughs> she's almost jubilant. She's waving her arms, and she's starting to gyrate around a little bit, and she's sort of causing a little bit of attention by the people who are watching her. She continues going on, and this went on for several seconds as the as the race was going, as the horses were coming around the track. But then notice what happens. So, suddenly the horse starts uh, starts falling, it'll be falling behind, and she sees all of her you know potential winnings going to be lost here. You know, I love the faces around her. The faces before that were kind of stoic and you know, and uh, almost maybe upset because they weren't winning. They suddenly are looking and they're, and they're and they're enjoying this. All right, remember to keep a camera nearby because you never know what you might see. You might be at the beach and someone buries the dog, or you might pass a rest area. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope that this is a, is help helps you do uh, better storytelling pictures. Hope it helps you make you know capture great moments. For more tips on visual storytelling, I, please go to my greatpicturehunt.com. And uh, there's several books on there and other things you can look at. I appreciate your time. I hope, again, I hope this helps you. And, uh, and good hunting.